and welcome. Thanks for joining us here at the table. Today I am joined by Julie, taking off the gloves for us today to have a good conversation. We've got Melody as well and I've got Kent. Kent, thanks so much for getting your brave on and joining us today. Token male, please be gentle with me. Oh, no, no, you'll be right. You'll hold your own, I'm sure. And I'm Rachel, so thanks for joining us today. Now, coming up today, we've actually got psychologist Claire Marsh with us and she's going to chat to us about the kids suffering anxiety and why it's on the rise and what can we do about it. Is filming a child's punishment OK? We talk about the boundaries of shaming and discipline and a study that suggests Mr Men and Little Miss books are sexist. Are you still reading them to your kids? And we've got Gia and Olive in the kitchen making a vegetarian gravy and Alicia has got some home chair workouts. Sounds relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> What's not relaxing is planning a wedding. The whole process of an engagement and wedding used to be very predictable, being dictated by tradition. However, with our changing cultures, we're seeing more and more of those traditions adjusted or just becoming obsolete. From walking down the aisle alone to throwing out the garter or out off, <laughs> the landscape of traditional wedding day is changing. But is it for better or worse? <laughs> now, recently, not so long ago, we would have seen the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. Hands up, who watched it? Because no shame here. I was excited and I watched it, but who watched it? No. You're on your own. No. Oh, man, come on, not even a little bit of enthusiasm. So that the last royal wedding I watched was when I was probably about five or six and it was Lady Diane, Prince Charles. Oh, yep, they wheeled well, out the TV and we all wheeled watched. Wheeled out the TV. <laughs> rolled yeah. out the TV, I like it. Yeah. Well, speaking yeah. of Lady Di, we've actually got someone on the production team here who has shaken her hand and oh, met really? her. Can you take a guess? Who do you think it might have been? Ooh. Who's old enough? Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, ooh. I would have been. Do they want to identify I'm, I'm themselves? I'm trying to think who would have been the traveller who might have <laughs> been there. Um, Julie? No, no one know. here. No one no, here. So it's from our production team, yeah. Ooh. I don't know. No, no yeah, guesses. Tell us. I'll tell you, it was AJ. Oh, oh AJ, so. he's, he's yeah. the voice in your ear today. He's the voice in my ear today. <laughs> if, you, if you're lucky, you might actually get to shake his hand because mm -hmm. he shook Lady Di's. So was, was he a little baby? <laughs> oh, no. No, 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 I think oh. it was at school in Canberra. Oh, oh. thank you. <laughs> Excellent, thanks. Uh. Have you washed it, AJ? <laughs> 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 then touch the hand of royalty. <laughs> Okay. I, w I would treasure this for him. <laughs> wow. The hand that touched the hand oh. that touched Lady Di's wow. hand. <laughs> Need to That's hear that right. story sometime. <laughs> I think it was Canberra School a long time ago okay. when she was out here. Mm -hmm. But going back to weddings and tradition, do you think we're sort of losing some of those traditions? And is that is that something you're sad about? No. No. <laughs> Why? Was that too Tell quick? us about yours. No, no, no. Yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Why? Um, well, I... I was just thinking about what you were saying about throwing out the garter, throwing off the garter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not want that in my wedding whatsoever. Like, just mm -hmm. the thought of, yeah. yeah, nah. So, I mean, it, it's really good that I really like that, the opportunity to be able to pick and choose. Like, even the whole um, father giving away the mum thing, father giving mm -hmm. the away the, the, bride. the daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually had my mum, well, backstory is that my dad's passed away as well. So, I, but that wasn't the reason mm -hmm. as well. So, I had my mum walk me down and then I had, my husband to be meet us halfway and we walk down together. I was a bit disappointed about that with the royal wedding, I have to admit, that Meghan Markle's mum didn't bring her down the aisle. Oh, didn't. so I thought, I thought you said she, you didn't watch it. I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but I heard <laughs> that it, they had to find some other, because it has to be a man to walk her down. But I thought, this I thought is, it should oh, have really? been her mum. This is the royal family, though. I mean, And they're very, very traditional. And I thought yeah. it was impressive that they sort of adjusted some of those traditions. My daughter's father has passed away. And secretly, I'm hoping that they'll ask me. I wouldn't yeah. ask them to ask me. Mm -hmm. But I'm kind but of hoping. secretly on yeah, national maybe they'll television. Watch this, well, but yeah. well done, yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Is there any changes? Did you have any changes in the traditions of marriage at your wedding? Yeah, totally. I mean, we wanted a traditional church wedding. We wanted that look and feel. But then we wanted to write our own vows. Mm. You know, we wanted to... And we were aware that there are various different traditions around the world. I mean, in the UK, for example, the bride comes down first and the bridesmaids come behind. Right. Whereas in Australia, we tend to do the American thing where the bride is the grand finale. So we went with that. Um, we used some aspects of the traditional vows but didn't use others. Mm. You know, do we really want to 
go with the whole um, love, honour and obey thing or, you know, mm. I, I was actually listening to Melody talk about her wedding yeah. the other day and some of the traditional elements that she brought from different cultures yeah. and brought that together. That fascinated me. Yeah. A tea us, ceremony yeah, or something? Yeah, that, that that's pretty much it. It's whose tradition are we talking about as well? Yeah. Yeah. And so we had to incorporate like my Chinese tradition. So we had a tea ceremony for um, the parents just to pay respect. Oh, nice. And then we had a little bit of a lion dance at the end during the reception as well, which isn't actually traditional Chinese wedding as well. It's actually a Chinese New Year thing. But, but the, I like that pick and choose thing. Though. Yeah, yeah. I like it too. I think what I really appreciate about all these changes that we're seeing in tradition is that people are questioning why they're doing them. Whereas I think, I look back at my wedding and there's some things I just did because mm. that's what was done at a wedding and then mm. there were other things I, I let go of. my older but... brother having a big argument with my mother about having a toast to the Queen. <laughs> Back oh, in the 70s. Wow. Did, did, yeah. You watched it, right? Did Megan Markle I did. and I Prince did. Harry toast the Queen? Um, oh, well, on the way out, oh, at the end of the ceremony, they sang God Save Our Gracious Queen and then in the carriage on the way out, he saluted her as they, as they yeah. rode past. But that's the reception, but, isn't yeah. it? The but toast it's, to the it Queen's It was relevant the to them. It was yeah. their mother. Yeah, his, well, his grandmother, yeah. <laughs> grandmother. Our, our reception was at a Greek taverna, yeah. smashing plates of oh, bazooka music. My wife's that's not Greek, Greek I'm tradition. not Greek. <laughs> Oh, we, just, we just loved it. <laughs> we, just it's pick it and choose. Yeah. yeah. Well, I got married 18 months ago, and so being a second wedding, we did it totally differently yeah. than the first time around. We had 25 people. That was it. In the, at home. Yeah. yeah. Just really casual. Yeah. yeah. It's nice. I think as long as we're nice, putting yeah. a lot of focus, I think, into our marriages and not necessarily the wedding day, yeah. I think you can't go wrong. Oh, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we've actually got um, Gia and Olive coming up. We're taking you into the kitchen. They're going to be cooking some vegetarian gravy. Have a look. Go. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> hi. Hi. So today, what are we making? We're making gravy. We're making a vegan-friendly gravy animal cruelty free gravy. But that's not the reason we're making it. We're making it because uh, we are just trying to figure out healthier options for gravy in our house for the kids. So all it is is one and a half cups or two cups of vegetable stock, any vegetable stock that you have. Oh, she's trying to balance there. Now we're gonna put some tahini, two tablespoons of tahini. So this will give it some thickness and one tablespoon of soy sauce. That'll give it like that salty. Now, if, you, if your vegetable stock is quite, I don't know, strong, you don't want to put more than half a tablespoon of soy sauce because then it'll be too salty. Okay. And this is the magic ingredient. It's rice flour. It's a quarter of a cup of uh, brown rice flour and this is what's going to thicken the gravy. So we'll put that in there. And all you do now is you keep stirring until it's thick. This was a recipe I got from um, Forks Over Knives. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. It's a great movie, Forks Over Knives. It's, um, it's all vegetarian and, and, and vegan, but it talks about health. And um, yeah, the recipes on their website are fantastic. So I, I have fi I've changed it a little bit to suit our, the way we like our taste buds, to suit our taste buds. But yeah, it's pretty good. So we'll just let it yeah. thicken up. Is that delicious? That is so ripe. So I've lowered the heat. It just brought it to the boil and lowered the heat. And now as I've lowered the heat, it's starting to thicken. So it was cooking on the stove for probably around five minutes. As soon as it starts to thicken up, you can see now the rice flour is helping it thicken up. Then you know your gravy is nearly ready. There you go. So you just stir occasionally until it gets really thick. Oh, this is looking really good. And so what I've got for this, I've got some mashed potato because my kids love mashed potato. Um, you can add peas to it and you put your gravy on top. Let's try that here. Oh. Let's get some gravy on top. It's like a golden colour. It's really thick. And if you want it to make it a bit runny, you can add some warm water, but I, we love it like this. So there you have it, your golden, healthy gravy. That looked pretty yum. Love gravy. As we're getting colder, yeah. like that to... Oh, just comfort food, yeah. hey? Great. And <laughs> potato I've never and roast veggies. You I mean, I'm vegetarian man? to start yeah. off with, so I don't have meat gravy, but then vegetarian gravy is often... Uh, I just go for tomato sauce. Don't, I don't know. Wait, Does that make me a philistine? No, oh. I thought real men ate gravy. 
Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no I'm, I'm in women's television. <laughs> what can I say? Well, there's nothing like some roast veggies with gravy during the winter months. I think it's yum anyway. <laughs> So if you'd like to boost your immunity during these colder months, a part of the secret is eating healthy. And our recipe book giveaway today will help you do just that. The book is called More Nature's Superfoods. All you've got to do to get your copy, your free copy, is email us at hello at the table tv .com, or if you'd prefer to phone us, that's fine. The number in Australia is 1300 300 389. And for our Kiwi viewers, you can call us on 0800 694 673. All we need is your name, your postal address and the name of the recipe book, More Nature's Superfoods. Well, many of us worldwide will have grown up reading the Mr Men and the Little Miss books written and illustrated by the best-selling author Roger Hargreaves. These fond memories will have even prompted parents to purchase the same books for their own kids. In fact, it has been said that a book from the series is sold every 27 seconds. Phenomenal. Wow. But a recent study done at the University of Lincoln in the UK, as reported by news.com.au, labelled Mr Men and Little Miss series as blatantly sexist, with the storylines um, playing to gender stereotypes, female characters being more passive and the female characters actually being rescued more than the male characters. I hadn't even, sort of hadn't even crossed my mind and I did grow up with these books, but who else here grew up reading these books or had their kids read them? My yes. kids read them. Love them. Love yeah, them. love them. Kids and love them. Mm. Everyone's yeah. got fond, fond memories of these books. Yeah. And yes, I guess the study's been done and it's very factual the way it's come back. Oh, dispute That's me, well, dispute me. I'm not really <laughs> dispute the study. You, but the fact that when I read the study and I read the report, right, the first thing that came to my head was this is a topic that was picked by a student who was struggling to find a topic <laughs> for their thesis. <laughs> And, yeah. well, yes, I think it is. It's just a, pro it's a postgraduate student, so she's doing her bachelor's degree and she's wanting to do a thesis. And Look, by today's standards, maybe it is, but I'm not going to stop my children reading it. I, think that's I don't thing. think they get their identity from their Mr Men books. You know, surely they get them from their mum and their dad and the people they... You know, yeah, but spend they would, their time they would with. get it from literature around them. But, but I guess my take extent. on this is that he would have written it in a time where that was a culture that was really familiar and normal to him. Yep. Mm. To now sort of turn around and say, let's get rid of these books yeah. is quite dramatic, yeah, isn't in, it? In fact, I think the people... We only used to talk about the Mr Men books. They were just mm. called the Mr Men books. Yeah. Mm. The Little Miss thing was, uh, I think, when later. they probably started to merchandise it and have T-shirts and, like, the girls, well, I don't want a Mr Tickle T-shirt. I want a Miss... I want a girl one. So yeah. then they had to bring up the Little... So the Little Miss thing was already playing catch-up. Yeah. And then it, exactly as, um, was it Melody or Julie was saying, that was the era in which mm. they were written. So it yes, reflects yeah. the culture around you. I think we can yeah. look at any literature or movie or from that time and it will look sexist by today's standards. Oh, I, I, I would think so yeah. because that's the normal yeah. culture of that time. But the th important thing to note, though, is that the study, as much as I'm dissing it, did say mm. that, you know, it's a percentage, so it's just more percentage. So it's not like as if mm. the women, right, generally, or the little miss, generally are bad characters who need help. There are some... It's, it's not all the time. So yeah, one of the other things that came out of the study is that the the little misses had less to say in their books than the M Mr Men. Except and that's for little actually... miss Chatterbox. <laughs> Except for her. <laughs> but that's quite reflective of our movies today as well. So... Uh, we, I guess we've still got a ways to go. Mm. But there's also in Victoria, in Australia here, so there's councils there looking to ban gender stereotyping books um, in From schools, in kindies and in libraries. Oh. Like we're talking Ta Thomas the Tank Engine yeah. and a few other you know, things. Look, the, yeah. the elephant in the room here is really the fact that boys and girls are different. I mean, I've, I've got a sister who has three daughters. You've got three daughters. You, yeah. you, I hope... She can back me up. <laughs> um, you will try, you know, like maybe you're a, you're a feminist, you want your yeah. daughters to have all the options there for them. Yeah. So here, here's a truck, here's a teddy bear, here's we've a doll. We've got the train set, we've, we've got, got the, the Lego, set. we've got And that. some girls will love it and yeah. other girls will just be like, <gasps> Bobby! You, and you, even within that... You know that, what I mean? And everything yeah. has to be pink and it's all princesses yeah. and ballerinas and you as a mum are just say, oh, I really, you yeah. know... And I even look, within that, that I was the same. I tried to give my girls, you know, opportunity, because I've got girls too, to play with whatever they wanted. And I've got... I had one girl that could be as cold as anything and she'd want to put a little pink fluffy T-shirt on, you know, and the other one that's into yeah. skateboarding and surfing and... That's right. They, as you know? say, they are into different things. I think I had a heart attack when my kids were too much into pink. It did my head in. But anyway, <laughs> we're going to move on. We're actually going to take you to Alicia. Apparently she's got some home chair workouts. Have a look. <laughs> 
it's Alicia, the table's resident personal trainer, back with you. Today, with girls, we're going to talk about how you can do a workout anytime if you've got a chair at home. <laughs> so, um, so what you're saying is I have no excuses. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So look, you can really get creative with your workouts when and where you need to. So even if you can't get out of the house, can't get to the gym, you can just use even a chair. So I want to run through a few exercises with you today that you can do at home anytime, anywhere and create a little like good 15 minute home workout and actually get a sweat up and feel your muscles from it. So Who's going to be my first volunteer? I think I, think I was volunteered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I'll up. So we're going to start with just some tricep dips. Okay, so basically what you want to do is come in front of the chair. You can kind of sit your butt on it first. Yep. Then take it off a little bit. And then we're going to dip down Righto. into... And get back up. And get back up. That's the hard part. <laughs> Which is why so, you're doing it, not me. <laughs> you want your feet we'll out like really about 90 degrees or a bit more than that and the heart the, the further away they are the harder it is right mm. so the, yeah the closer and the easier so then you just want to take your your back just a little bit enough away so that you can yeah. drop down and then push up again okay okay where are you feeling that Rach? um like in the back of my arm yeah. perfect good that's good that's I where you want to think feel about it. that okay. <laughs> good. Not, that's all nowhere because it's strong <laughs> Another one you can do is just literally sitting on the seat here, leg extension. So if you sit up nice and tall and then you just like lift one foot out in front and then keep swapping them. Hmm. It, you don't think it's much until you do it for 30 seconds or more. Oh, no. And then you, start, <laughs> you will start feeling it here in, in your upper legs, in okay. your quad. So that's a pretty cool one as well. Um, and then another one you can do is like a split lunge. So basically you stand in front of the chair. Then you put one foot just resting on the back. So, okay. yeah. So this is going to work your balance here. And if you take your front foot maybe a half a foot length like forward. That yep. Far. Yep. And that's going to give you room to lunge. Okay. So if you just kind of bend that front knee. Down. Yep. And up. So it's not a full lunge, but okay. you'll definitely feel that afterwards as well. So there's three little ones. Now another one you can do. I might get Melody up for this next one. We'll put the chair over here. You can actually use the chair if you're struggling to get your planks or your push-ups happening on the ground. So what you would do is you would just kneel in front and do it here. Okay, so do you want to give it a go, Melody? So is this meant to be easier than... It is meant to be easier because it's on an incline. <laughs> yeah, right? maybe I could actually do these. Yeah, exactly. That's it. So you bring your chest down towards the chair and it's not going to be as much body weight yeah. as you lean forward, okay? Yay, cool. <laughs> and then the second thing you can do here is actually just rest your forearms on the chair and then you kind of lengthen your back out so that you sort of, it's nice and long. And then you can plank here as well. And you can just pull that belly button in towards spine like a normal plank, but it's going to be less strain on your core. And you can actually do this pregnant as well. And it's not going to, you know, put as much strain on your core muscles. So really good one. So there you go. If you ever need, well, yeah. If you ever think you have an excuse not to work out, you don't if you have a chair. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. So, look, you can get creative with that and I hope that helps you get some workout time in at home as well. All right, see you later. Well, we all want our kids to grow up into strong, resilient and productive members of our communities and to be OK with who they are and ready to tackle anything that might come their way. But more and more studies worldwide suggest that mental health issues are on the rise in our kids. Beyond Blue reports that one in 14 young Australians, for age 4 to 17, experience anxiety disorder and that was in 2015. With us to talk about the rise of anxiety in our children and what we can do about it is psychologist Claire Marsh. Claire, welcome. Thanks for joining us again. You've been here before. We really appreciate you coming in here. One in 14 kids aged 4 to 17. What is this? Is this, is this genuinely on the rise, as they say? Yeah, generally it is. And of those 14%, we see that 7% of those, so, so about half, are experiencing anxiety in general. Mm. Yeah. Why? Why is it, Why is it on rising? The right? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are changes in our society. You know, we see that kids have to deal with a much more fast-paced track of life and um, there are a lot more influences and expectations, especially now that we see uh, globalisation and the internet coming into play. Children are getting a lot more information from around the world and parents as well are, are putting greater expectations on them in terms of their schooling and performance. 
So how do I, how, how would I pick if I have an anxious child? It's a good question. I think what we see in an anxious child is a combination of different factors. So um, in order for us to recognise that, we see changes in behaviour, we see emotional responses, um, and as well we see changes in their thinking and, and the kind what of What type of emotional responses do you mean? Like as in outbursts or like what, what do you mean? Or, or what kinds of behaviour yeah. too, mm. yeah. Certainly, yeah, the, the kind of emotional responses we see is more of a sensitivity. Okay. They might get more upset easily and they're going to be seeking more reassurance from their parents and just lacking confidence in doing new things. And so behaviourally, we might see that they will cling to their parent, you know, they will go for that extra hug and seek reassurance. And it can even be interpreted sometimes um, as defiant behaviour because mm. so um, a parent might see that they're refusing to do something new. A lot of yeah. those things you were saying we've probably seen lots of children. Yeah. So when does it become a problem? When does parents yeah, need to take the next up, step? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. When it becomes a problem is when it really interferes with their daily functioning and we see that maybe their worry is becoming disproportionately higher than what it should be for their age um, or disproportionate to the actual situation. And it might be stopping them from engaging in things that, that normally they should be able to do around that age, like going to school, you know, going to their sporting groups and, and generally enjoying life. Now, something I read about an, uh, anxiety in adults, sometimes it comes across as anger. Would that be the same for children as well? Yes, very much so. Children can actually come across as irritable. And um, again, we see that in the avoidance of things and the refusal to do things. And so being triggered and having that fear can just simply make them restless and irritable. So yeah. can anxiety be, have a genetic factor? Is it something that children can learn from parents or something they can pick up? from watching their parents? All of those things, yeah. So there is a genetic predisposition, we know that, that um, a, a child can be more vulnerable to getting anxiety. But certainly it can come through in, in modelling and parenting styles and the way that the parent interacts with the child. Mm. I, I've just been thinking about this, Claire, and just wondering if in some ways we as parents and our society is doing wrong by kids in, in terms of... <laughs> I mean, first of all, we've got family breakdown is on the rise. Um, we've got a lot of kids being put in childcare and separated from their parents and, you know, end up with anxiety, clinginess. And then you've got at school, it's all, you can't take your shoes off, you can't climb a tree, you, can't, you might get hurt, you know, and there's, mm. society is yeah. fearful and afraid of someone's going to get sued, someone's going to, you know, and I think kids pick that up, you know, when they should be outside playing, you know, climbing trees, And they've got the influence of bones. social media, yeah. which is right in their face, is that another contributing... Yeah, yeah. And not connecting with other kids yeah. where they could be bonding and dealing with that stress. Yeah, you're spot on. And these are all influencing factors as to why we're seeing that rise in anxiety. And you mentioned one thing there, which was, I guess, being more protective. Mm. And that's something that um, parents do in response to seeing their child being anxious. Um, they might generally protect them from the thing that's triggering that fear. Um, they will, you know, give their child a lot more reassurance, which we, we know that that just reinforces it. Mm. It can actually increase the anxiety and maintain it. But but I guess the opposite, can be hard for the opposite extreme we've seen in previous generations where it's like, man up, son, and yeah. you need to learn to swim and just chuck you in the creek. Chuck and, in the deep end. You know, stoic which, style. Which pr promoted a lot of fear, a lot when of When I came home from school as a child, mm. it would be quiet and I'd have time just to relax and think about the day and disconnect from my friends and everything that was going on. But this generation doesn't seem to have that no. time to be doing that, just to disconnect and mm. calm down. Yeah. Do you think that has an effect? Yes, that's part of it, that we have those pressures and that fast-paced life and we don't create that space. And, and what you were talking about there is um, authorita authoritarian parenting, mm -hmm. which is where we see um, high expectations and also really harsh responses and punishments mm. and a low level of nurturance and warmth toward the child. And so it's that kind of approach of, oh, just you'll be right, just get out there, just get over it. Mm, toughen up. And so we, we know that doesn't help. We can't reassure them. We can't tell them to toughen up. What do we do? <laughs> I was going to say, it's all on us though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it feels Not like... necessarily. There are many other factors involved yeah. in it. So we can't just necessarily narrow it down to the parent. Um, you know, there are environmental factors and, and many other things going on, especially pressures in the school environment. But it's a good point, you know, what can parents do? And we're not just saying that 
you know, they're, they're stuck in a rock and a hard place. But there is a middle ground and it's called authoritative parenting style, which is different to the authoritarian style, where it's mi a mixture of limit setting, but also supporting the child and being warm and nurturing toward them, but mm. encouraging them to face those fears and to give things a go and, and to potentially fail at things. And that way they learn that resilience, but they have that supportive base. Mm. Yeah. So recently we have seen um, in some in some of the media, and there's been an article on it recently, about parents who are then videoing the way they discipline their children and putting it up online. Now, so, yeah, some people are calling it, you know, shame, shame parenting and bullying mm -hmm. parenting. I sort of get it. I kind of get it because I think in some ways parents are feeling like like we're told you're not allowed to punish your kids anymore and so they're sort of a little bit defiant and saying I'm tough with my kids That's I know how, how I to treat them right and they're sort of making a point I think by doing that but the question is is this actually good for kids well, yeah, my question is is putting it online is that is that the step that's taking it too far Absolutely. I think putting it in that public domain, you know, you imagine that we all make mistakes and you imagine if that was filmed and put up online, you know, it's kind of there for everyone to see and probably for Once all it's time up. as well. I think yeah. parents, parents are forgetting that in a few years the kids will be doing the same thing to their parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Yeah. I don't think and I want if, my If kids your kids are little, though, the impact is going to be less. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, Charlie bit my finger again. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. is that kid's yeah. probably, yeah. what, 20 now and that's hilarious and <laughs> Yeah. always will be but yeah. but as they get older and they're more sensitive to these things and they're yeah. trying to find their own yeah. identity is that sort of creating extra anxiety for them because there'll be some kids who'll be able to laugh it off but there are some that won't yeah and I think it, it feeds into that shame which is really disempowering you know we're disempowering the child to then believe that they can change that behavior and and I feel a bit sad because those parents are missing an opportunity there and and they're falling into that authoritarian style and they're they're shaming the child and giving them a really harsh punishment but they've missed an opportunity for learning and for showing them the right behavior you know as Christians right we believe that when when we make a mistake God forgives us and we move on mm. if you if you if you film a child's mistakes put it online the Let it live forever. forever. Yes, yeah. immortalise oh, there. How do you move yeah. on? So why do you think parents are doing it? I think that parents, again, are wanting to get creative with their parenting and perhaps even rallying support from other parents. Do you think they're frustrated, though? Like, they're so frustrated with either the child or the way, as you said before, they don't feel like they're allowed to discipline. Do you think it? Do you think it's out of frustration they're doing it? Yes, I feel it is because perhaps there's also a lack of attunement and they're not quite sure how else to deal with the behaviour. Mm -hmm. And to be fair to parents, you know, we do fall into the parenting style that we're used to and that we know and mm -hmm. maybe our parents did similar similar kind of things. But, um, yeah, we know that, again, that authoritative parenting style, the more nurturing and warm and open um, with limit setting is going to help a lot so more. So you're sort of saying it's a cross between the two. It's, it's authoritarian and sort of making those boundaries but doing it in a really gentle and loving way mm. yeah. that creates less anxiety. Is that... That's right. Yeah. And being attuned to our child is really important. And then creating a space where we can connect with them and help them deal with those worries. Again, par parents might be misinterpreting that behaviour. Yeah. There might be anxiety that is driving that behaviour. And so the punishment won't really help to... We might um, need to, to switch off, off our own social media and look more towards <laughs> our kids. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, Claire, loved having you here, loved your thoughts on this. Ladies, Kent, thank you. <laughs> we will see you next time. Don't forget you can always jump onto our social media and have your say there. We will see you next time. Bye for now.